This is 2OF Entertainment. Hi, it's Kiffin Le Bates here, and today I thought I would talk about the Treasure DAO hack because it illustrates a number of interesting things about smart contracts concerning code is law and concerning testing. So to, to summarize first, the Treasure DAO hack involved someone buying over 100 NFTs with a price of zero, even though they've been listed for much, much more. And in fact, the total listing value of the NFTs in question was around about 1.4 million dollars and the question then is well how did they manage to do this and it boils down to the fact that the smart contract developers thought it would be clever to handle both ERC721 and ERC1155 tokens in the same buying function now you may remember from my previous video that these are two token standards on the Ethereum network and ERC721 is an NFT standard and ERC1155 is a hybrid NFT and fungible token standard. And as a result, you can have more than one copies of a particular type of token in an ERC1155. But other than that, they're generally used in the same way that ERC721s are. And the hack involved the fact that for ERC1155 tokens, you have to specify a quantity that you want to buy, whereas for ERC721s, the quantity will always be zero. And this is what tripped up the developers, because developers, when they analyze their code and think or try to think as testers, often have a problem in that they get localized on individual lines of code and forget the meaning of what has happened in the lines before. So their scope tends to be very narrow and this is to be expected because development of software is all about focus. And what the attacker did was they noticed that they could put the quantity equal to zero in the buying function and then try to buy an ERC721. And whereas for the ERC1155 tokens, there was a check to make sure that the quantity that you're buying is sensible. For the ERC721, by the time the code got down to that bit, the developers had forgotten about that quantity number. And the price that the buyer had to pay was quantity times the price of an individual item. So if you set quantity to zero, then you have zero times the price, which comes back at zero. And the contract therefore goes, okay, the price is zero. Here's your token. And I expect zero ETH off you. Thank you very much. And as a result, the attacker was able to walk off with 100 NFTs. So there's your first issue. The amount of testing and auditing that needs to be done for smart contracts is remarkably high because there are an awful lot of subtle bugs that can have very, very serious financial repercussions if you don't catch them. And testers are not the ideal people to be conducting this kind of analysis of the code because they tend to think in particular patterns. In particular, developers tend to think about how your code is going to get you from A to B. Whereas testers tend to think more along the lines of if I'm traveling from A to B and I decide to do something stupid, what happens? And most of the time what happens is either nothing or something that is detrimental to the user. But in smart contracts, occasionally something happens that is extremely beneficial to the user, which in this case is the ability to walk off with almost one and a half million dollars worth of tokens at no cost whatsoever. So this then raises the second question, which is all the articles were talking about the NFTs as being stolen and the spirit of the marketplace would imply that yes, they were stolen. People had clearly listed their tokens at a price and they were expecting to get that price for the token. So any judge looking at the case would say, well, of course, the seller of the token should have got their asking price. They shouldn't have been allowed to use a trick or a loophole to get out of paying fair market value for these items. 
but of course if you stand by Coder's law, well, the fact is that the inputs to the function were perfectly valid and there were checks all the way through the code to make sure that uh, certain silly situations could not occur and the fact that there was an oversight is a, an interpretation of meaning of the code, not an interpretation of literally what is there, because literally what is there is that you can buy ERC721 tokens for a price of zero if you ask for a quantity of zero. It's the interpretation that you're asking for a quantity of zero and therefore should not get a token in the first place that is what goes against the uh, spirit of code is law. And I haven't decided on the uh, side of the meaning is important, not the coding, and it is going to be an ongoing problem in smart contracts because they are initially, or they were initially put forward as a way of avoiding all sorts of requirements for legalistic interpretation and meaning by just stating what it is that you want. The problem is that just stating what it is that you want turns out to be an intractable problem. Anyway, that's today's video. Hope you found it interesting and it gave you some food for thought and I'll see you all in the next video soon. Bye for now.